In academic circles, a favorite type of question to ask on an exam starts with the words compare and contrast. Ever been there in that test? They have like these two ideas, they have this, situ this, this situation, these two situations, and they're like, want you to compare this and want you to contrast these things. And, uh, and which means it's probably in the form of an essay or discussion question, which I honestly loathe essay questions. Uh, not only do I loathe answering them, I also loathe grading them. Uh, it's just a lot of work. So I found that uh, my life as a teacher is easier when I get more objective questions, but then, then you got to do some essays because there's people that think better that way than they do just, you know, put putting true or false down or something of that nature. Uh, but thinking about comparing and contrasting, uh, in Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8, two different types of people are considered, and they're seen in stark contrast. And you might want to go ahead and turn there, though I will get the text up here in front of you momentarily. And the only here's the only similarity that exists between these two people. Okay, they're contrasted. In Jeremiah 17, 5 3, the only similarity is that they have both put their trust in someone. The only similarity between, between the two. They both put their trust in someone. Um, Jeremiah, uh, which this is, of course, a portion of this text that we're looking at this morning. Jeremiah, prophet of whom we know more about than any of the other writing prophets, was called by God around 626 BC to prophesy to the southern people. All right, so let's get let's get this context. Of what we're about to look at here in our heads. Around 626 BC, God comes to Jeremiah and says, "You're going to go to Judah. That's what we're going to call the southern kingdom." This this would be about about, about 100 years early. All right, the northern kingdom, known generally by Samaria was taken into captivity by the Assyrians, never to be resurrected again. And at this point, when Jeremiah comes on the stage, the southern kingdom is essentially facing the same thing. Except in their case, they're facing the Babylonians, which had become a juggernaut, okay, by this, by this point in time. And Jeremiah's mission was both destructive and constructive. Let me explain. All right? On the one hand, Jeremiah solemnly lambasts Judah for their idolatry, their wickedness, and their corruption. All right? The punishment that was on the horizon was something that Judah deserved. Okay? And so... So he goes in. You're going to see, if you want to read the Jeremiah, you'll see him calling them out on their idolatry. You'll see him calling them out on their wickedness and so forth and so on. Just detailing how, how ugly things have got. On the other hand, Jeremiah also, at the same time, sought to bring Judah to repentance. And he was holding out hope that she would yet escape her, her impending demise. Okay, so there's times where he seems to say, you know, if you'll just turn back to God, things, things don't have to go down like this. But let me say this. The future was quite bleak, all right? And here's why. In Jeremiah 17, 1 through 4, which is the four verses before you get to verse 5 through 8, here's what we read. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With a point of diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of the heart and on the horns of the altars. You know what that's saying? That's an indelible. Have you ever had a piece? I've got a pair of pants. Um, khakis. And I love these khakis, but I'll get to wear them uh, anymore. And I'll tell you what. Because right here on the side, there is a blue ink dot. Right on the side, right here. And every time I look at them, I just see what you know what I see. I don't see them. All the other beautiful um, beige khaki pants. All I get focused on is that one blue dot 
I've washed this thing, I've tried to bleach that spot, I've done everything I know to do, and it will not come out. You know what he's saying about, about Judah's sin here? It's bad. It's written in a devil. It's like got a diamond written, etched it in stone. It's, it's, it's a bad situation. And it says, while their children remember their altars and their asher, which is like the, the bales, you know, they've gone after other gods, adultery, beside every green tree on the high hills, on the mountains and the open country, your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave to you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know, for my anger of fire is kindled that shall burn forever. So, Judah's future is bleak. Um, God has his intentions here pretty, pretty clear. Jeremiah's been very clear. They're in trouble. And in Jeremiah 5 through 8, I think, you know, Jer Jeremiah records some words from the Lord. Uh, you'll notice at the start of verse 8, thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. And I think he's presumably presenting Judah in these, in these four verses with a choice. We like Judah, and this is what we need to pay attention. We like Judah have to put our trust or our final alliance in someone or something. In other words, uh, we might put our trust in God, or you could choose to put your trust in yourself, or to put your trust in another human being, or to put your trust in a thing. Now, granted, we all to some extent find ourselves trusting other people. For instance, if, if you got on a plane this afternoon, I promise you, you're going to trust that the pilot is going to get you to your destination, am I right? But that's not the kind of trust that we're talking about here, all right, in this context. We are talking about the kind of trust in which there is deep hope and reliance and confidence. It's that which we expect to hold firm when everything else fails. All right? It's we, we put our, we rely on and find our security in this person or thing, this being or thing. And this is what we expect not to fail when everything else does fail. That's the kind of trust we're talking about in this context. And so the question that Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8 presents us with is a pretty simple question. In whom do you trust? And your answer to this question is the difference between being cursed and being blessed. All right? So here's what we've got. Uh, share this with you. Here are the two dispositions. All right? And what I've tried to do is highlight the contrasts. According to our passage, in whom you place your trust, whether a human being or God, is the key difference between being cursed and being blessed. By the way, as I mentioned, this word trust here, this word is in both these both sections here. That word comes from a Hebrew word that means to rely on, to be confident in, or to find security or feel security. Okay? That's what this word means. And, and, and probably the New Testament equivalent, interesting enough, is pistis or pistuo, translated belief or belief. Alright? Belief is not just what? Some mental thing. It's got to do with deep seated trust and the willingness to act on that trust. Okay? And so here you've got one is cursed, one is blessed. Both do trust. That's their similarity. But one trusts in what? Man. And one trusts in God. <clears throat> Contextually speaking, all right, let's think about this. This is Jeremiah writing to the people of Judah. Here's a question we've got to ask ourselves. In what way would Judah have been guilty of putting their trust in man? In what way would Judah in that day and time have been guilty of putting their trust in man? 
there's a couple things that come to mind. And you can find this later on in Jeremiah. If you want to read like Jeremiah 27 and just work through those chapters, there's two things that come to mind where we would say Judah, this nation as a whole, has been guilty, and their leaders have been guilty of putting their trust in man rather than God. One is that they relied on false prophets. Hananiah is a prophet we don't know, you know, we know a little bit about from Jeremiah. This prophet came on the scene basically telling the people, listen, this whole Nebuchadnezzar Babylon invasion stuff, it's going to end. God's going to shield you from it. It'll, it'll, it won't last very long. Like two years. How long did it last? More like 70 years. At least that's what Jeremiah said. And that's what history shows. But yeah, basically you had this false prophet. And, and as a matter of fact, I, will, uh, I think this is pretty interesting as I was as I was reading through here, one of the things Jeremiah says to this prophet Hananiah is this. Listen, Hananiah. This is in uh, 28.15. The Lord has not sent you. And you have made this people trust in a lie. So one way that people, one way people could put their, what? Could put their faith and trust in man is to just believe everything that's coming out of their mouth. <coughs> Whether they're true prophet, false prophet, or whatever. I mean, it's important to see that we can fail ourselves if we put our trust in man when man is not speaking the truth. <coughs> Another thing, and this is probably more to the point, do you know what a lot of these kings did when they saw that Babylon, the Babylon was <coughs> coming out? Knew that they're, you know, that they were about to be uh, <coughs> under attack. You know what they started doing? They started forming political alliances with other people like the Egyptians. <coughs> or they even tried to form political alliances with the Babylonians themselves so they could save their country. <coughs> and they were hoping that when, when Babylonia comes and don't have enough allies, that what? They could actually defeat them in battle. <coughs> you know who they're forgetting in this whole equation? God. What are they relying on? They're relying on man. And my question is, can we be guilty of this today? Now, I realize that, um, I do realize there's still false teachers that we could put our, what, our faith and trust in. Uh, I, I really, you know, I don't know what extent you and I are going to have to call in foreign alliances in a battle against another congregation or another nation, you see. But is it the fact, is, isn't it the case that many people, even Christians today, have been guilty of putting that, that, that reliance and trust in lesser things. All right, let me give you one lesser thing. This is, our, this is sort of, this is an irony, I think, that, uh, that we've got to kind of pay attention to. But in Western civilization, people often look to money for security. You know, as long as I've got money, you know, I'm good. Now, if we really, if we really look at money at its most basic level, do you know what money is? It is a green piece of paper. Okay. And here's the irony. Now, this is the thing that so many people lean on, put their trust in. All right. And here's what's funny. Guess what is on the back of every denomination that's ever been created? Is that not Ireland at its finest? Or saddest, maybe? You know, ah, oh, this guy got more good. That's all I need. Meanwhile, God's like, no, I'm sorry. You know, Paul called that a form of idolatry. Colossians 3 and verse 5. But is it the case, is it not also the case that besides being put in our, our trust in the thing, we can also be guilty of putting our trust in people. Alright? We put our trust in maybe philosophers. Or maybe we put our maybe we put our trust in politicians. Or maybe we put our trust in an elder. Or maybe we put all our trust in a preacher. We put all our trust in people. Uh, I came across this story. Um, and it's an old story of a father 
They took his young son out and he stood him on the railing of his back porch. And then he went down and stood on the lawn and encouraged this little fellow to jump into his arms. And I don't know, we, we, they do little things like this like at school, you know, like you just lean back, learn to trust people and all that. Okay, so uh, the father said, I'll catch you. I'll catch you. And after a lot of coaxing, the little boy finally made the leap. And when he did, the father stepped back and let the child just smack the ground. And he picked up his son and he dusted him off and he dried his tears and he said, let that be a lesson. Never trust anyone. Now let me give you something. Let me think about it. One hand, that story disturbs me in this Okay? I don't I don't like I don't I think that's a bit dramatic and unnecessary way of teaching the kids the lesson that you're wanting to get across to them. Alright, I understand that. Also know that uh, I just don't like the middle of your father just kind of, you know. Uh, and also know that is there not a sense in which we need to learn to trust other people? You know, I mean, what, what kind of relationship do you have that you don't have trust? All right, now I understand all that. So on one hand, the story disturbs me. But on the other hand, the story does in fact echo what we're trying to learn here in Jeremiah 17, 5. <coughs> Cursed is the person who puts his trust, his final reliance in who? A human being. A fleshly being. That is not where your trust comes. Because at the end of the day, people are people, people are not God. Okay? A, a, a person is a human. A human is not God. Uh, they cannot do what God can do. People will let you down. People will fail you. People will make mistakes. Other people will, were never meant to take the place of God, ever. No human being can deliver what God can deliver, and no human being on the face of this planet can promise what God promises. No way. And so, <clears throat> if you are not place our trust in man, we are cursed, but if we place our ultimate trust in God, we are blessed. This is what was in our reading just a moment ago. David said in Psalm 62, 8, Trust him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So you gotta put, you gotta see this. Very stark contrast. One trust in a man or men or humanity, one trust in the Lord. That's their dispositions. Now, how do we look at their dispositions? Let's look at their respective destiny. Okay? The person who trusts in man is likened to a what? A shrub in the desert. And the person who trusts in God is likened to a tree planted by water. And these words are very reminiscent, by the way, of Psalm 1. If you were to go back and read Psalm 1, you'd see that some of the imagery is very similar. Now here's the question. I look at this, it's like, what would you rather be? A naked shrub in destitute surroundings or a green tree in lush surroundings? What would you rather be? Tumbleweed? Or a tree with just beautiful foliage and a lot of fruit? Now you look at that picture, and I think all of us are leaning one way. Alright? So what I did here is I'm going to I'm going to contrast these two for you based on what we see here. One I'm calling the shrub man and one I'm calling the tree man. The shrub man is the man who puts his trust in man. The tree man is the man who puts his trust in God. The shrub man should not expect what? For anything good. It is possible that good may come this way, but he will not see it. He will not enjoy it. It will pass him by. The man who trusts in that even, and this is, this is tough, to, I guess, to let's see again, but here's sort of his lot. Thirst, solitude, and uselessness. Man, trust the man. The picture here is thirst, solitude, 
and it uses this. So dwell in what? Parched places. In a wilderness. In an uninhabited salt land. That is this man's destiny. He will not be a blessing to others. Why? Because he will bear no fruit. Now, on the other hand, the tree man can expect ongoing nourishment and vitality. Now, this is not to say that he will not face hardships. This is one of the fascinating things here. Notice what it says here. He does not fear when the heat comes, nor is he anxious in the year of death. The point being is that both the shrub man and the tree man are going to have to deal with hardships. Both of them are going to experience the heat. Both of them are going to experience the drought. But one doesn't fear it. Why? Because his roots are deep and they are grounded in the Lord and not in man. And another thing is, not only does he not only does he just survive the drought, but he thrives during the drought and he produces, does not cease, it says, to produce fruit, which is a symbol of being a blessing to others. Okay? So you got these. These two, two realities that, that stand out here. And here's the thing. In God's mind, there is no middle ground. All right? It's not like we've got a choice between this and this and this and this and this. You know, one of the primary reasons Judah would fall is because they put their trust in man and did not put their faith in God. One of the ways we're going to fall, one of the ways we can expect cursing, curses or being cursed is by being people who put our trust in man rather than putting our trust in the Lord and putting our trust in God in the universe. And we have a choice. The choice is pretty simple. If you place your trust in man, you will live in the desert, limited, shrunken, and shrewd. If you place your trust in God, you will enjoy a constant source of refreshment and you will become a constant source of of blessings to others, no matter, no matter what pain, sorrow, anxieties, or hardships come to them. If we had to perhaps summarize the teaching of Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8 in one sentence, here's what I would say. In whom you deposit your trust determines your destiny. That is the teaching of Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8 in a nutshell. In whom you deposit your trust determines your destiny. You know what's interesting? Could this be true of a nation? Could this be true of a congregation? This is obviously true for the individual. And here's the thing. If we think about this in terms of salvation, there really is no alternative, is there? If it's kind of like this, if you want to go to hell, put your trust in yourself or put your trust in another human. That ultimate, final reliance. If you want to go to heaven, what does the New Testament emphatically teach? You are going to have to trust in Jesus and in the blood of Jesus, and in the righteousness of Jesus. That's where you've got to place your faith. That's where you've got to place your confidence. The song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and what? Righteousness. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to live with God forever, and with his people forever, it is in God and in God alone that you should place your trust. That is the clarion call of the New Testament. I want to close with this point by an unknown point. He said, or she, I'm not sure, it's unknown. So we don't know if this is a man or if this is a woman. But this is what the poet wrote. Trust him when dark doubts itself. Trust him when thy strength is small. Trust him when to simply trust him seems the hardest thing of all. 
Trust Him. He is ever faithful. Trust Him, for His will is best. Trust Him, for the Lord of Lords is the only place of rest. That sums up in a beautiful way what Jeremiah, what God through Jeremiah was trying to tell the people of Judah today. And that message right there <coughs> is still applicable to do. In whom have you placed your trust? Have you placed it in a thing? Have you placed it in a human being? Or have you in fact placed it in God? That's a big question. It's a question you've got to answer. This morning, if you are not a Christian, but you are willing to come with a heart full of faith, penitent of your sins, confess his name, be immersed in water, forgiveness of sins, we would be willing to accommodate you this morning. It may be that you are a Christian. Maybe your confidence has been misplaced as of late. And perhaps we can pray with you or pray for you. We can happen anyway from now to the